Welcome, LilyPod listeners and LilyTube viewers. Uh, we have a guest today that we are pretty excited about having because we minister to lots of mid-singles, but our experience is, is with divorce. Uh, we haven't uh, experienced being mid-singles that were never married or widowed. And uh, our guest today, uh, Lori Carr, is a widow, and she's going to help us understand the perspective of widows in the church. In fact, before the show, I think she told us that she was the spokesman for, spokesperson for all widows everywhere. Right, Kathy? <laughs> yeah, actually, she, she, she knows that everybody has their own experience and that she can't speak for everyone, but she has an, really quite an amazing journey and story that I think that a lot of uh, widows and widowers will relate with her and the, the things that she understands about the challenges that you face uniquely. So we're really grateful to have her. So I'm just going to give a quick introduction so you can get to know Lori and then we're going to dive in. Um, Lori Embry Carr was born in Rexburg, Idaho. Her parents divorced when she was eight years old, and she spent the remainder of her youth flying back and forth between her parents' home in southeastern Idaho and southern California. She, looks, she likes to say that she is the perfect mix of a city mouse and a country mouse, equally enjoying small town parades and big city lights and sandy beaches. Lori met her late husband, Chris, at Ricks College, and then they were sealed in the San Diego, California temple. They were married for almost 25 years before he passed away in an accident in January of 2020. They have four children and two grandchildren to which she is wholeheartedly, heartedly, sorry, wholeheartedly devoted. Lori has an associate's degree in communications and certificate, certificate in horticultural floral design. She loves all things domestic and has enjoyed being creative in her chosen career as wife and mother. She especially enjoys interior design, organization, and landscaping architecture. Most recently, she's taken up learning the electric bass and enjoys performing concerts for her kids who humor her sometimes, but often ask her to turn that thing down. Lori is very dedicated to the Lord and to her membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and she is serving currently uh, in the young women as well as ministering to her beloved sisters. She also ten, attends the temple often and hopes to become a temple worker at the Orem Temple when it opens. Lori began dating again in January 2023 after taking time to heal from her husband's death and learn more about herself. She recognizes, she recognizes that this is an ongoing process as we never truly move past the death of someone we love. We just move through it and we are always learning about ourselves. She currently resides in Provo, Utah with her youngest teenager. Please send help and chocolate. <laughs> and she is fortunate to have her other adult children and grandchildren close by. Welcome, Lori. We're so grateful you're here. This Thank is, you. Yeah, this is going to be a different kind of podcast for us. And we're really glad that you reached out. So you, um, when you uh, reached out to us, you had mentioned that you take us on a walk with you every day <laughs> on your walk. So, so you listen in with your headphones on and our, our voices get distorted, I think, because you listen on <laughs> one and a half times speed. Yes. Um, <laughs> so they're, they're a little bit higher and quite a bit faster when we go on our walks together than they are here. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I thought that was so fun when you mentioned that you take us on your walks with you and that it's like having a friend walk with you and <laughs> Um, I would love some time for us to actually take a walk together. I think that would be really cool. <laughs> we like hiking. So if you want to go on a hike some Saturday. <laughs> yes, I love it. Yeah, the canyons are right here and it's, it's Absolutely. A, lot of, a lot of fun. Yeah, we just live along the mountain front and here in Utah. Um, different mountains backdrop for both of us because we're in different areas. But that Wasatch front, you know, it's beautiful. Yeah. My son and his wife and, and our grandbaby live down there too. So we like to have excuses to be in town. Yeah, in the Orem Provo area. Yeah. yeah. Well, it'd be great to go on a walk together and then I could actually get feedback when I have questions. 
<laughs> walking, it's like walking with a friend because you it, it's very conversational in the way that you two do your podcast. Um, and often as I'm listening, I feel like I've just asked a friend a question and they're responding to whatever I ask them. Oh, that's cool. And then I think you reached out because there was another question you had that we hadn't addressed yet. And that's why we asked you to come on, essentially, because in communicating back and forth, there's some things we've been missing um, naturally because we don't have your experience. And that's why we're so grateful to have you here. So um, let's dive in. Um, so you, uh, you mentioned in your story um, that you were you married and sealed to your husband in 95, 1995, and you were 22 years old at the time. And, um, and then, um, you know, just like most people, it, it was ups and downs, like you had your strengths, and your weaknesses, you had your um, good times, your bad times. Um, and then that accident was uh, electrical. Is that right? Yes. And so in January of 2020, it was like just a sudden change for you, like totally yes. unexpected. Was Chris an electrician? No, he was a property manager and, oh. and property acquisitions. And they had just purchased an apartment complex in Salt Lake City. And he was a very hands-on um, property manager and decided he wanted to go and hang a banner on the side of the building and somehow came in contact with a power line while he was hanging that oh, banner. So sorry. Yeah. And you also mentioned that one of the hardest parts about this, and it would have been hard anyway, is that he, you weren't able to see his body. Yes, he, he left for work that morning. He kissed me goodbye. He, he said um, something along the lines of, um, I should be home early today if I can beat the traffic. And if not, I'm not sure when I'll be home. And then I, I was at the store and the police came and, and told me at about, um, one, one 30 in the afternoon that day. Um, so it is difficult to have somebody leave and then just never see them again. But, but in a way, I think it was a tender mercy because, um, I don't know that, I don't know that I would have wanted to see his body um, either. There's the memory of that that you also have to live with as well. Right. And I had that same thought about, I, you know, my son was killed in August. And it was also a sudden. Pretty traumatic accident. And I, I have an idea of what I would have seen if I had seen him, but I didn't want to remember mm -hmm. him like that. Mm -hmm. And then the other issue for me there that you just touched on is uh, the police came to our door to let me know what had happened. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when they first told me, I think I was in so much shock. I didn't cry. I didn't, I mean, mm -hmm. you don't know that. I took the information they had for me. Um, I went and did something that I had just started um, before they got here. That kind of while he was still in shock. It involved some other people. And so... Mm -hmm. I got done with that half an hour later or something. And that was when I kind of broke down. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, having the police come, that was really surreal. Mm -hmm. I I don't know that that's the best way to inform I think people, my kids but... were nervous that Jeff had like, and, and, and they know Jeff, so I don't know why they thought this, but they're like, is Jeff in trouble? Like, <laughs> the cops are like, no, we really need to talk to him right now. Cause we said yeah. we're in the middle of something and mm -hmm. they're like, oh, that's stern. Yeah. Did they find yeah. you at your home? Um, they came to my home and I wasn't here. Um, and then they called me on the phone. So, so the 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 press had arrived to the scene and done away. news stories. Um, and the, the police chaplain was concerned that I would just find out in some random way. Typically they like to have a family member inform, um, but they they just felt like they had to rush things. So the police called me, I was at the store and and they they said, we have some news, some bad news that we need to give you and we need you to come home. And I said, well, I can't drive now. Um, I'm too afraid to drive. And I, I knew strangely the minute that they, I it was a, the call on my phone was an unknown number it said. Um, and I never answer those. 
And for some reason, I just knew I needed to answer that. And I knew as soon as they told me that it was my husband and I knew, I knew what it was. Um, like before they told you. Yeah. I mean, they, they, um, he said that he was a police officer, um, and that he had needed to speak with me. And I knew right at that moment that it was my husband and that he had passed away. Wow. Um, so I, I think that was another tender mercy that I was prepared in that way. But, um, I think they would have preferred to tell me at my home, but I just knew that I wasn't going to be able to, to get there. So they came to this store and they, they told me in the parking lot. Okay. okay. And as you waited, you knew. Yeah, I, I just, I almost knew it feels almost like I knew before I even answered the phone. Like the moment I saw the phone ringing that I knew just in that moment. That is, that is incredible. Um, what other tender mercies did you experience around that whole thing? I didn't know there were police chaplains. That's really cool. I, I had a former father-in-law who was a military chaplain. <laughs> So, and that I imagine comes in really handy and is such a blessing for at least the, the part that they feel like they can do, which is inform people personally rather mm -hmm. than in, in personally through media. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, sorry, go, going on, um, what other tender mercies or synchronicities do you remember experiencing around finding this news out other than, you know, like knowing before you knew? Um, I think it, you know, it's a little difficult a, a, as I've moved farther away from it and I've attended therapy and I've read books. And so I think sometimes we can attribute things to just the way our brains work. And then I think there are things that we can attribute to tender mercies from our heavenly father. And maybe, maybe they're intertwined, um, together. Um, so one thing that they talk a lot about, about is, a widow's fog or a widow's brain that, that people will get where it's difficult for them to remember things. It, it can last for years actually. Um, but there is something in, in having a, a trauma like that occur that part of your brain kind of shuts down, I think, and, mm -hmm. and only lets in the most important information that you need to receive. And, and I felt like that day I was able to do all of the things I needed to. I had to individually tell each of my children I had one son that was on a mission and and we had to contact him on his mission and those were very difficult things to do but um I had kind of like what Jeff was saying there was a shock there and I was able to um almost take my own grief away for a moment and minister to my children and, and in, in a way even minister to the other people that were in my home and um, I think another amazing thing for me that I am able to look back to all of the time for that day in particular is okay. when you do have um, a tragedy like that occur in your home, um, suddenly your home is just full of people. It's full of all kinds of people. There's food there. Isn't there's that nuts? It's kind of chaos. And um so I would be sitting in the living room and the bishop would be there and his wife and the Relief Society president and even the police were still there and all these people were there and it would become very overwhelming suddenly for me and I would feel like I would need to escape to my room um, and in that overwhelm, I just imagined falling to my knees and begging Heavenly Father to take this from me. It felt way too much and as soon as I would get to my room, I would kneel down and I would think those words were going to come out of my mouth. And instead I just felt intense gratitude. And, and I, all I could think to do was to pray for the police officers that had to go and, and help my husband and thank Heavenly Father for their kindness and their professionalism and, um, and pray for them that they would be okay. And, and then thank Heavenly Father that my bishop had circumstances that allowed him to come and be in my home. And, um, and every time this happened throughout that whole day where I would get very overwhelmed around people, I would go into my room to pray for help and there was no help needed. It was just, I needed to thank Heavenly Father for all of the blessings. That it's I more had. like you needed space and quiet to do that. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm but it was, it was instant. It was just an instant thing. As I would kneel down, that overwhelm would go away, and that gratitude. And it was I've never felt so full of gratitude in my whole life, which is a very odd kind of dichotomy because I just had this horrible thing happen in my family. But that day, for some reason, it just went from feeling overwhelmed to feeling total gratitude, and 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 back and forth. That didn't last. That that intense feeling of gratitude but for that day it did let, let, me, ask, let me ask you something that's on amazing that. and I'm, I'm so glad you shared that with us because one, one conclusion i've come to you know since my son passed away was even though it was intensely painful and it's still i still have intensely painful moments with it um today is his birthday in fact the day we oh. were recording this um but uh, so, so those are kind of poignant moments, I think, but, but I think about it, um, like, all right, if I had my life to live again, and I could choose to be his dad and go through the pain of losing him, or not be his dad and be spared that, what would I do? And without hesitation, I would be his dad again. Mm -hmm. Is it anything like that? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, it was just gratitude for the current circumstances of all the people who were helping me at the moment, but then the gratitude for the life that I got to have because I had been with my husband for those 25 years and all the things that he had done um, in a way even to prepare me for that moment and to prepare our children to live without their father here on the earth. I just um, could never imagine going back and saying oh no if I know that my husband's going to die in 25 years no no thank you I'll choose somebody else that's going to live longer I, I just can't imagine that and I probably wouldn't have wanted to know that he was no go. and and in fact when I when my husband proposed to me and I went home that night to pray about it um I did get the answer that yeah, absolutely. I trust you with this decision and he's a great guy. Go for it. But you're, you're choosing kind of a hard path in life. Mm -hmm. Some things are going to be difficult for you because you're making this decision. And I don't know that if I had chosen someone else to marry, if it would have been all roses with that person either, there would have been difficulties that would have come with any, any marriage. Was there some part of your 22 year old brain that understood that it there would be difficulties with anyone and so you chose to have them with Chris I think I did I think because of my upbringing with my own parents um I knew that marriage took a lot of work I watched the, um, my parents so when I was a little girl uh, my parents never fought and it was it was literally just came into my room one day sat me down on the bed and said, we're getting a divorce. And it was completely out of the blue for me. Sounds like my um, divorce. We didn't fight <laughs> either, ever. Yeah, yeah, and, and that was part of the problem, I think, ultimately, mm -hmm. that they just never had conversations about really important things. And, um, but then I watched as both of my parents remarried and how they really just worked so hard on those new marriages. They also worked on forgiving each other and creating a relationship with each other that I can say now, all of these years later, and, and they had told me this as well, that they grew to a point with each other that they loved each other like brother and sister. And um, I've had many holidays, many Thanksgivings and Christmases where both sets of my parents were there because they were invited by one or the other to come and attend that, that celebration. There was never a time where I had to be worried, like at my my wedding reception, if I was going to sit mom and dad at this table and, um, you know, mom and dad at this table, I, I just never had to worry about That's them. So um, great for you. Yeah, the, it, it's a real example to me of what taking personal responsibility and then forgiving the other partner and then allowing Christ's atonement to come in and heal both of you. Um, and then to move on and to help do. your interactions yeah. with other people. Yeah. So, so I was able to see that, I think, and I, I knew at 22 that, that marriages took a lot of work. Um, 
So, it's almost like Heavenly Father knew you needed to know that, like through the way he answered you. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think it was also um, <laughs> in that in that same answer was, but Heavenly Father knows my personality, knows that I'm I'm very loyal and committed. My husband was as well. And I think in helping me realize that at the time that we became engaged, that it, that it, I was going to have difficulty in in my marriage, in my life with my children, you know, all these things. I wasn't getting married to run off to some fairy tale castle somewhere. And um, I think knowing that made any of the difficult times, the times when maybe my husband and I wanted to give up on each other, that that we didn't because right we didn't. because. And you, and you could have expected that based on your revelation and, and your choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd like to, to ask you to dig a, a little deeper on one of those points too, because I believe you told us that you had some regrets at points in the grieving process that uh, regrets about times when you maybe weren't as kind to him as you could mm -hmm. have been or had unkind thoughts or said unkind words or I, I don't mean to speak for you but can you talk to us about that and how how that kind of unfolded and where you went with those thoughts and feelings yes yeah, so um my husband and I are both very passionate people um, we, we have a lot of opinions and some of them lined up really well and some of them didn't. Um, and I wouldn't want to say that we're both very demanding, but I think we both knew we could count on each other for certain things. Um, so when we let each other down, it was almost, it was like we forgot for a moment that we were each doing a kindness or a good thing for each other. We had, we had grown to where we just expected it sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and so there were times when either one of us could be short with the other, um, impatient, you get tired, you, you get used to your companion and you're not your best self all the time. I think all those things are very normal and to be expected in marriage. But, but when he passed away, um, I think <laughs> regret can be a normal part of the grieving process and that survivor's guilt can can be a normal part of the grieving process and for me it felt like all of those times that I let him down in whatever way whether it was um losing my temper with him or just forgetting to do something maybe that was important to him um mm -hmm. I felt those very keenly yeah in, in a sense I felt as if I was being almost at a pre-judgment with God and that, and that I was being allowed in a way to remember some of those things so that I could repent of them and make changes for them. And I, I even felt the sense that my husband was doing, or maybe even is still doing the same thing on the other side. Yeah. So there's almost a little bit of connection associated with that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, I, I actually think that some divorcees who choose the path that you did, which was to learn about yourself, to grow from this experience, find themselves, it's not survivor's guilt, but it is a form of guilt associated with what, you know, what do I remember doing in the marriage that, you know, contributed to the dissolution of it. And some people can get stuck there, but I love the word you used was repent and change that when we repent and we change, we move forward rather than like stay stuck. Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. So and that's I think I can relate with. I think with any ending of a marriage, whether it's through divorce or death of a spouse, you're probably going to have some regrets. I can't imagine any marriage being so perfect that a person can't look back and see something that they might wish that they had done differently or that their spouse had done differently. So I definitely think that. Um, but we're more sensitive to it when there's so much pain surrounding the loss of that person. Yes. Yes. But even with divorce, there, there is still 
there's still the grief. You're you're grieving the loss of a marriage. Oh, you're grieving the loss of the sure. future that you expected to have with that spouse. Um, well, and everything wasn't always totally bad with my former wife. I mean, yeah. there were times when we were a loving family and we took vacations together that were memorable and fun and you know, all kinds of stuff. And you think, why did they want a divorce from me when we had so much that was good? Or And you know, some people have of... that. And I think there's a lot more grief in those kinds of losses, especially <laughs> if it's sudden and unexpected. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also people who end up in dysfunctional marriages the entire time and the divorce is more of a relief. But that grief happened through the marriage rather than mm -hmm. after. And so everybody mm -hmm. grieves, I think, at different times. Yeah, that way. Um, and, you know, then we've also we have interviewed a couple of widows who have um, one of them. Well, let's see. In both cases, um, there was illness involved. So they um, and one of them had actually quite a long time to say goodbye and to prepare. Mm -hmm. um, and so with your situation, that's a lot different. And honestly, the death of a marriage can be very similar in that some people it's sudden, some people it's, it's a shock, some people it was a long time coming. Mm -hmm. And um, the fact that you have experience with your parents having gotten divorced and then seeing their journeys thereafter it seems to me that when you later opened yourself up to dating again, um, that you can relate with people who've been divorced more than most. Um, perhaps, perhaps it's my experience with my parents. I've, uh, I've never felt the need to ever judge someone for being divorced. Even people when I know that they've really contributed to their divorce, maybe with unkindness or with being unfaithful I think I've always <clears throat> just thought there's a lot more to this story than I know always. so I I don't need to be the one to be judging why this ended or or who's at fault or or any of of that and like there's I'm enough doing, pain already you don't yeah. need to add to it yeah we're preaching that all the time yeah and, and I think particularly too particularly to non-divorcees Yes, yes, because people who who have no idea about it, which I can't imagine in today's society that anybody has gone kind of unscathed through life, anyone's gone through without knowing and having a good friend or family member who's gone through divorce. Um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. I'm so sorry. Um, I think as I've met other adults, especially as I've started dating men, um, all of them have been divorced. Um, I think that for me, I look at that, that big word divorced, and I don't think a person should be judged their whole life based on that one word. I've never thought a person should be judged on the one worst thing they've ever done. I think that there's always so many parts to a person and um, whether that divorce was a person's fault or their spouse's fault or they mutually contributed to that divorce which is typically the case um, there's always room for them to grow and change and I wouldn't want to put someone in a little box that says you're divorced so you're not worth my time I, I love that you said that and I'm sure our odd listening audience will really appreciate that too. Um, and it reminds me that the, what you reached out about, I believe was when you listened to Thoughtful Labeling, episode 34. And um, cause we, in that we talk about not labeling ourselves as, you know, what our experiences are as if that's all we are, mm -hmm. um, but just to radically accept our experience and be all the things we are yeah um, i mean i'm a divorcee but i'm also a husband a father a lawyer a disciple i mean we can go down the list of things and being divorced even though we have an organization that ministers to a lot of people who have been that doesn't define me right right and and actually you can look at it and say because of my divorce which i think you have both said many times you're the person you are today. You've learned valuable life lessons that For you sure. couldn't have learned any other way. And you're, because of the way you chose to come out of that, you're a better person than you were before. 
yeah Absolutely. better more prepared for each other for cert for certain mm -hmm. um you know because we've te teased about the fact that like oh well why couldn't we have just met first off well i mean there's lots of reasons that wouldn't have worked but um <laughs> one of them being we're we weren't who we are now and we right. couldn't be without being prepared mm -hmm. um and that's what really makes the magic for us mm -hmm. and what i think makes the magic for a lot of uh, later married couples who find um, that love after that really hard journey of loss and recovery and healing mm -hmm. and discovering, like you said, it's like figuring out who you are without your partner, who you've been mm -hmm. with your whole adult life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I know this might be a little bit skipping forward, but I'm wondering if you could speak to the concern you had about the label of being a widow that you feel is very difficult to get away from in like in the dating world in the in the complications you found well um i think there's maybe two parts to that and one is that i think a lot of widows do want to hold on to that label i think a lot of widows grief for a very long time and they want people to understand hey this is a label i'm putting on myself i'm a widow or a widower and um and i want you to know i'm hurting i'm not just single i didn't just get divorced i i almost think that there are some widows that want to almost elevate themselves and say well yeah. i i didn't cause a bad marriage or have a bad marriage or or my spouse didn't hurt me in that way so divorce, I, I could never label myself that way. And I'm not just single, but I'm widowed. Um, this bad thing happened to me. And I think it does take some time for people to get away from that and and get to the point where they can either say I'm widowed and, and it just like checking a box on any form where they ask you, are you single, married or widowed? It's You just check the box or they- It's they not a big on. emotional- Thing every time you check the box once you're ready to just check the box and just have it be a fact right right and and it doesn't necessarily necessarily carry all the weight or the pain that comes with that and I think it's probably the same with someone who's divorced I think there's a period of time where they almost cling to that label in a sense because of the pain that that comes with it and they want people to know to understand that well and typically <laughs> the, the, what they want them to understand is their story and how and i'm not saying this is wrong but how they've concocted this was not my fault i did the best i could you know i got left and, i got mm -hmm. abandoned it wasn't my choice either mm -hmm. especially in the church you yeah. know prize marriage so much mm -hmm. but i think we have to almost defend ourselves if we've been through a divorce um, in, in the beginning, and we, you know, we try to talk, I think in the beginning, maybe there's some trauma relief in doing yeah. it, telling your story, but I think you can get stuck there very easily. And a lot of people do. Yes. Yes. And, and get stuck with that. Well, I'm the wronged, you know, I'm the, the wronged divorcee. I'm the one who I didn't want the divorce. I didn't make this happen. Well, it was, it was him. And then we her. get rewarded with a lot of empathy and compassion, yeah. hopefully, mm -hmm. um, which then um, feeds the desire to keep doing it. It's kind of yes. motivating mm -hmm. to continue being that victim, so to mm -hmm. speak, mm -hmm. in your very specific way. Mm -hmm. And although I think everybody's story has you know, some, obviously it all has validity. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of pain involved. There's a reason why people tell their stories, mm -hmm. um, but it also has a price because then we're disempowered to move forward and to build a beautiful life when we're busy feeling stuck in the loss and the grief and the label of I really have this hard thing. Like, and, and I remember telling people all the time, I'm a single mom, I'm a single mom, I'm a single mom. Like, and you know, single moms do need some empathy and compassion because mm -hmm. there, you've got a lot on your plate, right? Yeah. Um, but not to the degree that it disempowers me to show up as I'm a single mom and I'm a disciple and I, <laughs> Um, I'm a musician and, you know, I'm all the things like, I'm not just that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me I ask think you. It's, 
Oh, oh go sorry. ahead. Sorry. Well, I wanted to ask you two things about grief really quickly uh -huh. um, before we move too far from that. One is, um, I think you said that you you found yourself sometimes thinking you were through a particular stage of grief and you would find yourself back there for a while and that you kind of skipped around the different the different stages and can you um maybe elaborate on that a little bit yes well so right after my husband passed away of course everybody was giving me books so i i probably mm. got a dozen books on grief um, on life after death, all, just the whole gamut. So I was just, I'm reading all of these books. I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to do this the the best way anyone's ever done grief. I'm going to do that. I'm going to read that's all these awesome. books. <laughs> but unfortunately, that's not how grief works. Um, right. I, I went to some, there are some amazing widow and widowers conferences that they do all around the Valley. They do them in Arizona, Texas, California, um, that the LDS church sponsors. And um, there's an amazing therapist that kind of started these and he still comes and speaks at them. And one of the things that he talks about is that grief is not a learned um, behavior in the sense that you could study it. You could have a PhD on grief. And unless you've experienced it yourself, you have no idea what it's like. It is something that you have to experience. You cannot learn about it. 100%. Um, yeah. So, and it's, and I think too, to add to that, your grief is going to be different for different people in your life. So when your parents pass away, it's a different kind of grief than a spouse or a child it's, or a friend or a sibling um, and, and at different stages of your life, it will also be different. So obviously my 10 year old grieved the loss of her father differently than I grieved the loss of my father when I was in my forties. Um, right. So that that is something about grief but the but the skipping all around so i would became very familiar with the five stages of grief um and i thought okay i'm gonna i'm gonna go through these stages and then i'm gonna be cured and it's gonna be <laughs> a perfect order <laughs> yes but that's not how it works and in fact those five stages were were created for people who are actually dying that 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 was not made their own them. death Yes, they were grieving yeah. their own death, not for the loved ones that were being left behind. So uh, I do think maybe some more research needs to be done on that uh, to clarify that for people. But um, yeah, you, you'll go through, I, for instance, denial and, and not being able to see my husband's body. There were times when I fully accepted that. And then maybe six months later, I just have this little thought come in my mind, like maybe he didn't really die. Maybe I imagined that maybe maybe he's in the CIA and maybe he they made it up. <laughs> yeah. um, so it would just come at very odd times. And like you're on the Truman show. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, Laurie, my brain still, I mean, it's been eight months or something since my son's death, but my brain, I'll still find it going there where it wants to try to find a way out. Yeah. And, yeah. And uh, of course I come to my senses as soon as I realize that, okay, yeah, short of the second coming, there's not a way out. You know? Right, yeah. So, yeah, but, but yeah. Um, my brain still wants to go there. It's like in self-preservation mode that way or something. So that didn't, right. I know, like you said, it kind of creeped in six months later after you'd already experienced acceptance. Yes, yes. And then, and then yeah. I've never actually felt myself be angry with God about his death, but there was a period of time where I was very angry with him. I was angry that he was careless. I was angry that he didn't prepare us as much for his death as he could have. I was, um, I was angry that I was dealing with an unruly teenage boy. And why wasn't my husband here to, to help me with this thing? Um, and I was angry at, at past things that I felt were not resolved in our marriage. And, and so there was even a period of time where I, I wouldn't say that I demonized him, but, but in my mind, I almost had to make him out to not be a very good husband. Like I like to cope for a little while. I had to think to myself, well, he wasn't that great of a husband anyway. So that, that lasted a certain period of time. And occasionally I'll come back. I'll have a hard day and I'll think, why am I out here shoveling all this snow? I shouldn't have to be the one shoveling. My husband should be here shoveling. Um, oh, so oh, anger okay. will come sadness. I will be driving down the road and I will see, uh, 
billboard that reminds me of something that we talked about once and I'll just suddenly start crying. That is the worst is this, the sadness and the crying that will happen out of the blue yep, right, for reasons right. that you don't understand even sometimes when you're in public with people and it's almost uncontrollable. Sometimes it can be very difficult to control the tears. Yeah. Um, and that does get better. So if does I it if, also um, feel kind of like, besides the fact that it could be embarrassing, um, does it also feel like kind of like you've just been hit on the head all of a sudden without warning, kind of like a, like shock almost. Yes. And yeah, so because you, you think you're around, done. Right. And then yeah. you walk around knowing that at any minute you could get shocked again. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you something crazy about that, well, Lori. I, I want to hear what she's going to say. Real quick. I don't, let me just say this real fast. Right. Yeah. My son, my husband, I don't have a husband. My, <laughs> my brother died when he was 17. He died of cancer, mm -hmm. but that was 30 years, almost 30 years ago. It was in October of 1993. And uh, so he's been gone a lot longer than he was actually here. And yet I can still have a moment. It happens probably two or three times a year now is all, but where I'll think of him in a certain way and I'll start to get teary even now. Yeah. And with my son, you know, it's more frequent than that now um, at, you know, the first week or so it was every hour um but i i think that does lessen with time but part of what i have had to accept with my son's passing is you know i i'm accepting the fact the most important thing to healing is accepting the fact that i'm not going to heal that i'm yeah. not going to completely get over it and I don't even really want to get over it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, I don't want to obsess about it 24 seven, but anyway, I want to hear what you had to say, but I thought that was an important place to insert that thought. Definitely. I think getting over it would imply that you never truly loved your son. Right. Um, and you would never want that. So his life had meaning to you and you as a father, you had meaning to him and you can't get over that no um and i i think that can be difficult when you break down crying in church and people want you to have gotten over it when it's been even a few months later they want to think you're doing great nobody wants to know they don't want to be uncomfortable yeah and they don't know what to do and frankly for the most part there is nothing they can do they can bring meals they can get you out on a walk or or take you to a movie um, but you're still going to come home. Friend. Yeah, you're you're going to come home to your empty bed and and all the things that you're missing. I think um, one thing that somebody shared with me that was really helpful with the grieving was they said grieving is kind of like when you're in the ocean and you're at first you're getting in and you're getting in deeper and those waves come and they topple you and you're under the water and you can't quite tell what's up and what's down and you're gasping and you're just trying to get up out of the waves and then you get up and another one comes and knocks you down again and this happens over and over and you you're barely getting enough breath but then the next time you come up you have maybe a minute or two before that wave comes and then the next time you get up maybe you even get a few minutes of just those nice rolling waves where you're just kind of body surfing and it just feels really relaxing and nice and you think everything's going great. And then a wave just comes and knocks you down. And you never really know when those waves are going to come. And they get farther apart. Right. But they still come. And you can't necessarily know when it's going to happen. So that was really helpful for me as I went through the process to maybe not put so much judgment on myself, even though I do sometimes still put judgment on myself. But to just allow myself to feel sad, to feel angry, to feel denial, to bargain, all of those things that we do. And then even to feel acceptance sometimes can feel like a betrayal of the person that passed away. When you accept that they're gone and you even feel like you're okay. And, and that's where I am now. I feel I still miss my husband. I still love my husband. I'm still so grateful for the life we had with each other, but I even have dreams sometimes where he comes back and I say, oh, Chris, you can't be here. I'll, 
all your clothes are gone. I've sold your car. Um, you know, I moved and we don't have room for you. There's not room for you anymore. We've, we've, we've moved through our life and I'm trying to get back to survivor's guilt. Um, it does. I think uh, sometimes you can feel great about your acceptance. It all feels really good and you're moving forward and then it will just a little thing will just click in your mind and you'll think, how can I be moving forward without this person? This is a betrayal of this person. You know, interesting um, that you would call it betrayal because I remember feeling to the, the point that if I accept my divorce, I'm disloyal. That was more the word. So it was like a different word, different feeling, but mm -hmm. still kind of a, like a questioning of, is it okay to accept this? Yeah. Yeah. Do I like that word disloyal. That's probably better than betrayal. Betrayal is probably a little harsh. And, and as I started dating the first few times I went on a date, I would come home, even if I had had a great time, I would come home and I would just cry and cry like the whole time home in the car. I would just cry. Um, right. because it was so confusing. It was confusing. That was not Chris. Yeah, it wasn't him. In a way, I wanted him to be there. I wanted to talk to him about my date. Um, I wanted to come home. Have to you him, ever tried to but talk I was, to him about your dates? I do. I actually, I actually talked to him about a lot of things, and I've, I've let him know that I need him to help me to find the right men to date. That it's important to me that he. Um, helps guide me in that direction because That's he knows beautiful. me very well. Sun Sunshine Johnson experienced the same thing where she, her, her, um, her um, late husband actually did lead her to her current husband. She's now remarried. And, and there was definitely that connection between the three of them. <laughs> and um, she tells that in her story when we interviewed her, but like, um, it's interesting that you're experiencing something similar. You're not as far in your journey yet and you're not remarried yet, but mm -hmm. you're saying like, I'm including him in this process. That's mm -hmm. part of my journey. Mm -hmm. That's really, and I, and I feel very much like he would want me to not go through the rest of life alone. Um, we talked, I think many spouses talk about what would you do if I died and, and, um, we, we actually had a conversation once with another couple and we ended up having someone ask that question. And the man of the other couple said, oh no, I would never get married again. I, I've been there, I've done that. I would never get married again. And my husband said, I'd get married right away. And mm -hmm. then another person said, wow, how does that make you feel Lori that your husband would get married right away? And I said, that makes me feel good. It makes me think that he had a positive experience and he, <laughs> he wants to do that again. Um, like marriage is great. And yeah. I know it because Lori was awesome. Yeah. And I, and I feel the same. I think my husband did a great job of helping me see the realities of relationships and the, and the work that needs to be involved, but also that when you work together, great things can happen. That's a really mature response. I actually really like that. Um, I'd love to just go back to what you and Jeff said about grief and the ocean waves that you refer to. And what um, I think Jeff said was just like, it's just those feelings come now and then and <laughs> they get fewer and farther apart, but they're always there because you loved, mm -hmm. because you loved someone, they're always there. Mm -hmm. um, and I would imagine like that that shock of the being knocked down that, or the embarrassment that might, you might be tempted to feel because you're in the presence of other people when it comes, cause you can't predict it. Right. Uh -huh. Um, that, that would, could cause a lot of anxiety mm -hmm. unless you surrender to it almost like I'm just yeah. going to let the wave knock me down mm -hmm. and I'll be able to get back up after it knocks mm -hmm. me down. It'll be fine. Like almost like an acceptance of the shocking, the shock that you can almost anticipate, but not when. Yeah, I think that's a, a key thing that hopefully is happening for people as they go through the grieving process. I think at first it can be so scary to be knocked down by those waves. You're not sure if you're going to come out. And so surrendering to them is very difficult because you think if I let myself break down, I'm never going to come out of this. This is so painful. I'll just fall apart. And they're, they're it's almost like every time you have a good cry, you come out 
feeling some relief, right? Almost yeah. like growing up when you have the stomach flu. It's like yeah. you get relief from You're not going to just keep vomiting endlessly. Yeah. But I think that it can, you can think at first when you're in intense grief that, you, that you're never coming out of that. And it can be really because scary to surrender. that wave crash all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you do it enough. You do see, look, I'm not going to fall completely apart. I'm not just going to fall into a heap on the floor and never get off the floor again. I will get up and I will keep but maybe going. Maybe I am going to fall into a heap. But I'm going to let myself be there as long as it needs, I need to be. Right. Right. And I'm going to stop caring about the judgments of others, whether I, it's not even so much the judgments of thinking that someone is maybe ma maliciously judging you, but it's the worry that you're worrying other people. You don't want to inconvenience other people. You don't want them you don't to, worry. Want to bring other people down. Like that's yeah. not, you're not a downer. Like yeah. that's not what you want. Yeah. You want so. people to know you're doing okay. Most of the time. Yeah, that makes sense. So I, I would love to demonstrate for, for our uh, watching audience and I'll, I'll describe it for my, our listening audience. Cause we were both on lily pod and lily tube for this interview. Mm -hmm. So, um, have you ever heard of the figure eight when it comes to grief that yeah. when you come to the, the center, uh -huh. so like if you, so it's a sideways figure eight. Okay. And that at first mm -hmm. it's like this. <laughs> It's super, yeah. super fast. It's like you're going 100 miles an hour <laughs> coming to that center point where you're getting crashed down uh -huh. those waves like mm -hmm. over and over and over. And that's probably why it feels like you'll never get back up, right? Uh -huh. And then it just gradually, I mean, like really so gradually, you can hardly perceive it. It just slows down mm -hmm. until maybe it's so slow that you only get to that center point where you get a crash mm -hmm. like twice a year. Mm -hmm. once a year maybe on memorial day like you know mm -hmm. maybe it becomes even more predictable because you decide when you're going to grieve rather than it crashing you down yep um but i've loved that image ever since mm -hmm. i've heard it and i just mm -hmm. wanted to share that here with you and i think yeah. it relates really well with your wave theory mm -hmm. yeah that is that's very helpful and i can see that that's very true at least it's been very true for me hmm. you you had mentioned um also that there were people who said a lot of stupid things <laughs> to you. And, and, you know, my favorite And you were one, gracious about it, by the way. Like, yeah, I yeah. know you said, I get that people don't know how to respond. Just like grief didn't have, um, isn't a learned behavior. It's, some, not, it's something we have to experience. Like, <laughs> knowing how to respond isn't a behavior we're trained in either. Right. I mean, that, you know, my favorite one that was said to me all the time when my son died, and people still say it, is he died doing something he loved. At least he died doing something he loved. Because he was hiking. What do I care? Outdoors. You know, what do I care? <laughs> it, it's yeah. like he's gone. Yeah. He could have lived another 60 or 70 years. That mm -hmm. It's not worth it that he died doing For something One of the responses loved. Jeff has said just kind of facetiously is like, he did not die doing what he loved. He didn't love falling off cliffs. Yeah, yeah. He didn't, he didn't love breaking his neck. Mm -hmm. He yeah. didn't love getting paralyzed. Mm -hmm. Right. No, those were not things he loved. Yeah. Right. So that's my favorite one that people say. And I don't think they mean any harm by it. I think they're no. they're trying to come up with something to say that might be comforting. And that's just mm -hmm. a stupid thing to say to somebody who has lost a loved one. Mm -hmm. But but why don't you Yeah, we'd like to hear kind of your thoughts on and see if, you know, other people who are listening who've experienced um the loss of a spouse can relate to what you're, you know, the the things that you kind of irked you. I think that the things that people say are more than likely true. Like he died doing something he loved. I think at a point you could say he well, you're right, he loved hiking and maybe 10 years from now, you can come to that conclusion yourself. Just like when people want to say to me, um, he's in a better place. Heavenly father needed him there. Um, he's with you all the time. Aren't you glad your, your family is forever. All those things are in a sense true, but they're there. I believe they, those are sentiments that a person needs to come to themselves right i love that so what you're saying is there's truth to what they're saying mm -hmm. just like there's truth to what even the thing that bothers jeff and and, and, and just 
for the record, I, it hasn't bothered me, but I know it's bothered him and yeah. it's not, and it's not anything that it's not a problem. It's not like he remembers who said it and he's mad mm-hmm. at me or anything like yeah. that. It's, it's more just that whatever bothers you. I think it's like what you, I think what you're saying is it's what I haven't come to a conclusion about myself yet. Yes. It's a, it's a great sentiment for somebody to share as a comforting thing to say but it's not a comfort unless you believe it yourself and and it's something that you have to come to that conclusion for so what I have found since since Chris has passed away the people that have been most helpful to me and and what I tend to fall on when I speak with other people who have lost a spouse is I don't say anything I try really hard just to listen to them and to validate whatever they're going through. So if they're angry, I'll, maybe I might not agree with why they should be angry. And maybe I can even look at objectively and, and think, boy, your anger is really making you miserable. If you could get over that anger, you'd feel a lot better, but that's not my place to tell them that it's my place to just listen and tell them I love them and that I know they're going to move forward and that they're going to be able to be okay. And until they're okay, I'll be there for them. So like encouraging with um, understanding. Right, right. Because I've, I've been through all those things. So I can't tell them you shouldn't be angry right now. Don't be offended by your neighbor that did this thing to you or said this thing to you. Um, I might not think that they should be offended, but it's not going to help them. If I tell them that it's right. not going to help them. In many cases, they already know that the person is in a better place or that mm-hmm. Heavenly Father needed them or whatever. You know, especially if 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 you're both church members, you have that understanding in common and they mm-hmm. don't really need a reminder of it. In yeah. The, because in that moment, it's like, oh, you're discounting the feelings that I'm feeling, you know, mm-hmm. you're, you're invalidating them. And, and I know they don't intend to do that, mm-hmm. but that's how it comes across, I think. And I think for the most part, what I've learned is that they're saying that for themselves, actually, they're saying it to make themselves feel better to, I think it's very frightening for people to think that their husband could go to work one day and just not come home or their son could go on a hike and just not come home. We don't want to consider that that's real. So when we're faced with that, it can be really frightening. And yeah. and I'm just a reminder. I go to church every Sunday and everybody sees me without my husband. And I'm a reminder to all of them that life is fragile and that any moment, any one of them could lose a spouse or a child or a parent. That is so <laughs> true. And in that reminder, it could make us all very anxious, but it could also help us take that those relationships more seriously and more and do more about connecting with our loved ones while they're with us because we don't ever know we're not ever promised Mm -hmm. i i do think about that too in terms of um when the kids leave the house now or when i talk to my my grown son i think about that um you know what were my what if these are my last words to them or whatever? I don't want to feel this, the kind, you know, more regret than I have to, if anything else happens. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I mean, I, I'm not paranoid about it. I don't think about it or dwell on that all the time, mm-hmm. but it, it just reminds me a little bit. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, I think what, and, and you can tell me if I got this right okay. or, Um, And there's so much more to your story that I want to move on from this, but I think I just want to summarize what I understand you to be saying about how we can all show up better for people who are grieving any kind of loss Mm -hmm. that we don't personally understand. Mm -hmm. First of all, bite our tongues Mm -hmm. and try not to give advice or tell them how they should think about things or tell them what we think about their things Mm -hmm. because we want to allow them the agency of coming to their own conclusions in their own time. Mm-hmm. And that be a good listener. when we bite our tongue, we're a good listener. Yeah, mm-hmm. we're a good listener. And then when we do respond, you know, we do so with um, validation of their, of where they're at, mm-hmm. even if it's not where 
we hope they'll be someday. It's where they're at. And then we encourage with understanding. Like we gently nudge them in a direction that will be helpful without, you know, telling them where they need to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and then kind of to your point um, on the life is fragile and that you're a constant reminder of that. You know, I know that that could lead to more survival, survival guilt for you. Like the, I'm making everyone uncomfortable feeling. Um, but I also think there's a gift in it because when we realize life is fragile, cause I lost my sister when she was young. Um, in fact, Jeff and I were both about the same age, just had our first child or what I think for you, you're about to have your first child. And, um, our youngest sibling, um, our young, my youngest sister, his youngest brother died at that stage of life for each of us before we knew each other. And I remember putting on a lot of like, um, old passwords, <clears throat> like life is short Be- when, cause after my sister died, I had that sense of life is fragile. And, and I think after I, I remember like, so we work with a lot of grief in the divorce process in our, through our coaching practice. And, um, so when this happened with Jeff's son, um, we got a new taste of grief again, like in a totally new and unexpected way. Um, but the principles that we've been teaching our clients were very helpful. And that is intentionally choosing thoughts um, around the situation that lead to, to, to more healing. It doesn't mean leading to more happiness and avoiding those waves. It, in fact, it means re- accepting that those waves mean we love, that we love deeply, that, you know, that lo- deep love is what is why we want to have that, that figure eight, you know, experience and that we're going to stay on that path and that we wouldn't have changed anything <laughs> that we wanted to have those relationships. And there's a certain beauty in the pain because we realize that comes from love. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. And so, um, but I remember the first day we, we just kind of took a walk to try and kind of just try and process what happened, like with the police showing up at that door right behind us and giving us that news. Um, and I remember my first thought was, our parents should never bury their children. This is ridiculous. This is awful. Even though like my, the, the coaching side of my brain knew that's not a helpful thought. It's a thought that I had to have initially, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then a week later, we had um, some ministering brothers come over and give Jeff a blessing. And mm-hmm. after that, they didn't say anything about Henry, uh, about his son and losing his son. They said something about their own experience that really resonated with me. And I decided to adopt their thought. And their thought was, my mom always told me And this was based on her own loss Mm -hmm. that no one ever dies before their time. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what? I think that's a more helpful thought. I'm going to adopt that thought. Mm -hmm. But I had to be, like you said, I had to be ready Mm -hmm. to receive that, that new idea. And I liked how it was delivered, which was just, this is what my mom said. Yeah. Based on her experience. So I do think if we're going to share anything, we share it unassumingly yes because that helps a lot I think sometimes when we offer a a good thought they might on their own accord accept that thought Mm -hmm. or embrace it and integrate it Mm -hmm. without us needing to tell them they need to have that thought yes yeah I I mean when you when you go into therapy um oftentimes your therapist doesn't tell you the answer he might ask a question or, or not even to you, but it almost seems like into the air. Like, I wonder what would happen if I, if we thought about it like this, or I wonder, I wonder sometimes about this. And, um, I think with, with you talking about the Bishop, just saying that about his mom, he was, he was giving you the chance to decide whether you wanted to adopt that thought for yourself instead of telling you, you had to adopt that thought for yourself. Mm-hmm. Is yeah, that what it was very yeah. unassuming and unrelated? Really? It was just him sharing like yeah. that experience. Yeah. 
So do you think I got that right? The, like that's yeah. what I would advise on how to show up better for those who are grieving? Yes, absolutely. And I think just if you're with somebody and they fall apart, let them fall apart. If they're angry, let them be angry. Just let them feel the emotion they need to feel. Because I think we live in a society where we've been taught, stop crying, don't be mad. Um, all, all of that is negative emotion when the reality is it's just real emotion and it, it's how we handle the emotion. That's the important part. Mm -hmm. Let me throw out one more thought for you on this subject, because I'd like to, to get your take on it, um, on, on this subject of, of grief. I, I know when I was going through my divorce, which is not the same thing, but it, but it is a grief experience. There were times when I didn't necessarily <clears throat> want to talk about it. There were certainly times when I did. Mm -hmm. But there were times when the whole subject exhausted me and I wanted okay. to be somewhere else doing something else. And I have a cousin who used to have me over to his house just to watch sports, to get wings, to, and it really helped me feel like a more normal person mm -hmm. uh, than I was in the midst of just this all consuming grief and pain and regret and disappointment and all of that. Um, so that that's one, uh, one, thought and then the related kind of like another thing we can do for people who are grieving is just allow them to have a normal moment yes right. and so i don't think we should push that talking if they don't really want to mm -hmm. and then the other the other uh thought i guess is i think at church you mentioned feeling kind of isolated and like you didn't belong there and mm -hmm. and so speaking to people in our audience that may be on the other side of this where you know they don't know quite what to say to someone who has lost their spouse um in our case i think some people after a divorce people almost think it's you know maybe it's catching maybe i'll get it if mm -hmm. if i interact like you said person. the life is fragile <laughs> yeah. in case kind of thing or, yeah. or, the, or the other one which i think is am i sure if i interact with this person that i'm supporting the right person maybe the other person maybe they were at fault i see yeah. Mary, and I know. Like, <laughs> why why do we do that yeah like, she <laughs> doesn't do that and, and for me it's like you know what? It doesn't really matter whose fault it was. They're a child of God. They're in pain. Let's see what we can do, you know, yeah. regardless of whether, of who might be at fault. You're not sinning or enabling by being kind to someone who may or may not have made a mistake. So let's add yeah. to this list. Just be kind. Just be yes. kind. Yes. Well, and I'll tell you, I this is something I can't speak to. Um, about being divorced. I don't know how I would feel about this, but some of the most wonderful things that, that were so helpful for me would be when someone would come up to me at church, a man would come up to me at church and he would say, you know, I was, I was just thinking today how much I miss Chris. I, I worked with him in the clerk's office all those years and I, we had such great conversations and I was just thinking today how much I miss your husband. And it felt good to me to know that other people thought about him, still cared about him, that he didn't just disappear to them. So that is something I think can be very helpful to someone is to give them a space to talk about um, their spouse, not in the sense of grieving unless they need that. I guess ultimately what you want to do is ask them. No, I thought you, it didn't bother me that sometimes people would turn him into an angel or sort of deify him. Yeah. Make him like he was perfect. And yes. Talk, talk about that. So you didn't mind appreciation, but you wanted it to be kind of on a real level rather than like um, yes. put him on a pedestal. So I can give you an example of this. I have a, a good friend in the ward um, who is divorced <laughs> and we're the same age. And we were both together one day at church talking and someone else came up and started talking to us and um the conversation with that other person was the other person was going to set my friend up with somebody okay and talking about how great this person was and set them up and then 
they turned to me and they said, you'll, you'll get used to being alone. Your husband was so amazing. You'll never find anybody like him, but you'll get used to being alone. So it was, it was just such a stark difference between the two of us. The, the, she, there was an assumption that this woman was ready to date, wanting to date because her husband must've been horrible that it just mm-hmm. must have been so horrible with her but with you it must have just been all roses and you'll never find anything <laughs> better because your husband was perfect um and my husband was not perfect he was an amazing guy but he was not perfect and so there is kind of that difference there's the i really missed your husband for this this great thing that he did um but telling me i'll never find anybody as good mm-hmm. as him that's like not you helpful shouldn't thing. be looking and you should just get at least yeah. alone. Like that's a big judgment on their part. Yes. And I, and I, and I have gotten that from many people, kind of that, that attitude of, well, you, you're already married, you're already sealed to someone and it's over for you now in your life. You're, you just need to be happy that your husband is beyond the veil. He's there somewhere. And um, he's a real active part of your life, but you just don't get to see him, feel him. Um, or hear him for and the next mind that you might 40 be years, 40 or 50 yeah, years, right. You know? right. <laughs> like no one else has to live your life. It's only your choice. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, I, I love what you wrote in your, you know, when you kind of told us about your story, when you said that it took you a while, like over a year to feel the stableness of your singleness. Like, <laughs> sorry, actually you said feel stable in my singleness. <laughs> That's how you wrote it. And I love, love, love that phrase. I've never really phrased it that way before, Mm -hmm. but feeling stable in your singleness and knowing that you're not ready to date is huge. Lori, it has been so great to have you here. And I know we have a lot more to talk about. So I would like to put a little bookmark here and um, and have this to be continued. So there's going to be a part one and part two of this um, awesome, amazing, wonderful discussion. And um, we'll say to our listeners for the meantime that. Remember, anytime is a great time for more love in your life. Thank you for showing up and watching and listening.